an honour and a privilege to bring God's word to us today. Uh, our reading is from the book of Second Samuel, chapter eight, uh, verses the whole chapter, verse one to eighteen, uh, and that is found on page four hundred and eighty-two of the Pew Bibles. And I'll just give us a minute to turn there. This is God's word. In the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And he took Methag, Amma, from the control of the Philistines. David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought tribute. Moreover, David fought Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah, when he went to restore the control along the Euphrates River. David captured 7,000 charioteers and 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but a hundred of the chariot horses. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 of them. He put garrisons in the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, and the Arameans became subject to him and brought tribute. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David took the gold shields that belonged to the officers of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem from Teba and Berathai, towns that belonged to Hadadezer, King David took a great quantity of bronze. When Tu, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son Joram to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadadezer, who had been at war with Tu. Joram brought with him articles of silver and gold and bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord, as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued, Edom and Moab, the Ammonites and the Philistines, and Amalek. He also dedicated the plunder taken from Hedadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Joab, son of Zariah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was recorder. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. Sariah was secretary. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and Pelethites. And David's sons were royal advisors. Thanks, Sharif. Everyone else is glad that you got to read those names and not them. <coughs> Can I just have a quiet word to the children? For a moment. Uh, children, do you have your own Bible? And if you don't, talk with me afterwards and we'll get you one. Because we want you to read the Bible. We want you to read the Bible because we believe this is the living word of God and this is where you will learn and understand who God is. And in the Bible, right at the beginning, you will read that you are created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. What a wonderful statement to know that you are precious in God's sight. In other parts of the Bible, you will read about people doing wonderful and kind things. And next week, as we come to chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, you'll read about David doing something very kind to someone who other people would have thought he didn't deserve it. But David showed kindness. God shows kindness. 
But here's the thing. And children, this is what you need to know. All of us need to know. Is that the Bible does not just have simple and easy things to read. It has things within it which are difficult to understand. And I want you to know that now so that when you are a bit older and you start to read through the Bible properly and other people start to tell you, do you know what's in the Bible? You won't be taken by surprise. Back to your colouring room. But keep your ears open. Adults, you already know this. Or I hope you already know this. I remember sitting in a, uh, a group of uh, young adults, senior teenagers, uh, in a discipleship program that I was part of, and saying to them, you know, the simple question that you say to Christian teenagers, do you believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God? Yes. They all said, yes, we do. Have you read it all? No. No. Well, there's a conflict here. If you believe that this is the Word of God, then it makes sense that it is something you would read and it would, you would take it seriously and you would seek to understand it. So an ancestor of the children, read your Bible and pray. These are two good words that should go together. Read your Bible and pray because sometimes you'll get to something like 2 Samuel chapter 8 and you'll just be left scratching your head. Lord... We've just come from 2 Samuel chapter 7 where we have seen David wanting to do something for your glory and you've said no and you're going to do something even better for him and we've seen David pray in humility and in wonder and then we turn to chapter 8 and it's violence and death and I don't understand it. God, help me to understand it. There are reasons that people disagree with the Bible. There are reasons that people reject Christianity as a viable option for them and part of that is because of what they read in the Bible, that they just don't understand it and cannot agree with it. And so they'll say things like this, it contains things that are just wrong. It contains things that are just wrong. Well, I want to push back on that and say, by whose standards are they wrong? Are they wrong by your standards? Well, where do your standards come from? Consider this comment from Australian historian and theologian John Dixon. We are right to look with shock and disappointment at the way medieval Christians accepted violence as normal. It seems clear that in seeking to convert European warrior societies, Christians themselves were converted to a martial ideology in clear contradiction to the teaching of Jesus. We see this with clarity today and even question whether those violent medieval Christians were Christians at all. But he go, John Dixon goes on to say this, I'm equally struck by how medieval Christians wholeheartedly obeyed Jesus' call to shun wealth and pursue charity for all. They said the one who does not show material mercy to those in need has not known the divine mercy toward their sins and they pursued this idea with great passion and success. For me, this is the most striking part of medieval church history, which is his sphere of, uh, of knowledge. He then goes on to wonder, what would those medieval Christians think about today's Christians and the wealth that we live with? Some people might say about the, about the Bible, well, we've grown out of believing in those, you know, those things. You know, there was that God of the gaps. There were those things that we didn't understand and, and so we just put God into those gaps. Well, I want to say, don't be so arrogant. I got this uh, comment from Nick Needham. Every generation has an uncanny tendency to view themselves as more enlightened than those that have gone before. Do you think this generation is the end of all knowledge and understanding? If you do, take heart. That's what your parents' and your grandparents' generation thought too. And you think they were wrong. 
there's a good chance your children will think you were wrong too. People might say, but in the Bible, God asks people to do things that are horrendous. Well, let's be clear. The Bible records things that are horrendous and some of those are done by people who are God's people. But let's not assume that God wants those things done. The Bible records what has happened. And what has happened isn't always what God commands. Now, there are a couple of key phrases in chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles open uh, there, please do. Please keep your Bibles open if you've got one in front of you. Chapter 8, page 482. Uh, There's a couple of phrases that might be difficult for us to to find if we get stuck on verse 2. And I'm going to take a punt that most of us in 2023, we'll get stuck on verse 2. So let's just skip over that for a moment. Look at verses 6 and 14, where we see this summary. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And then the other key phrase is in verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. If you have a different translation, you might see words like justice and righteousness or equity. This is how David is ruling his people. And so I ask the question, what do you expect from a king who rules with justice and righteousness for all his people? What kind of things would you expect from a king, from a political leader who rules with justice and righteousness. And I think if we ask that question, we can help, that can help us to work through some of the difficulties of chapter 8. And when I say that, you might not find chapter 8 difficult at all. I do. And if you don't, praise God. Firstly, I'll say that he protects his people, that this is the task of someone who is a leader, somebody who is a king, who is ruling with justice and righteousness, he will protect his people. And one of the ways that he will do that is to defeat the enemies of his people. Now, chapter 8 doesn't stand alone, of course. Chapter 8 picks up a story that we've read before. We've read read about the enemies of Israel in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. We'll read about them again in chapter 10 and the victories that David has. The Philistines are old enemies. If we've, for those who have been with us through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, um, and if you've had a look at the posters on the back there, you'll see the Philistines are the old enemy. We talk about uh, the English cricket team as the old enemy, and perhaps for good reason, but the Philistines are the old enemy of the Israelites in these Old Testament times. David gets a great victory against a bloke named Goliath. And even if you don't know much about the Bible, you probably know David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine warrior. The Moabites are also old enemies. Well, we're not surprised the Philistines get, get mentioned here as being uh, battled and, and fighting against them. The Moabites, if you know a bit of the Bible story and and what's gone on before this, you might be a bit surprised and both not surprised. Because the Moabites are people who have fought against Israel in the past, leading up to this. But there's also a couple of interesting things for David. The first is Ruth. Ruth, you know this, some of you will know the story of Ruth. There's a lovely few pages about Ruth before 1 Samuel. A wonderful lady. But she was from Moab. She is David's great-grandmother. Also, when David was an outlaw running away from Saul as Saul was trying to kill him, David took his parents for safety to Moab. And yet here in verse 2, we're struck by this 
strange, horrendous, difficult to grasp statement. Not that he defeated the Moabites, that we could understand. But that he made them lie down in the ground, measured them off with a length of cord, and every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. Why? Why would David do that? I don't know. I don't know. Why does David treat them this way? Well, I might get a hint in another battle in history, Asian Corps or Asian Corps. Henry V, King of England. In a moment of what I think is idiocy, leads his troops across the channel into France. They end up at this place called Asian Corps, where the English are hopelessly outnumbered. And the French, in their arrogance, believing this will be an easy battle, charge. It's muddy, it's wet, they get stuck, the horses start trampling people in their panic, and the French are destroyed. And then this happens. So the French are not you know, are killed, but they're also captured because back in medieval times, if you could capture a nobleman, a man of high birth, um, that's a good ransom. And if you could capture the king, well, that is a great ransom. And there's history between England and France there. And so there's this great gathering of prisoners, these guys who have been captured. But ignoring the rules of war, the king, Henry V, commanded his army to execute all the enemy troops in their custody, save for a few dukes and other illustrious men. Now, we would find that horrendous. But here's an interesting comment. Though not particularly controversial at the time, even the French chroniclers did not fault Henry for his actions. Many have since labelled the killings an early example of a war crime. I'm led to agree with that last statement. This seems like a war crime. This is a horrendous thing that has happened some 600 years ago. But it happened, and the people of that time understood it. I come back to 2 Samuel and chapter 8, verse 2, and I'm confused by it, I'm confronted by it, and so I need to ask myself some questions. Because the Bible doesn't tell us David's motivation here. It just tells us what happened. And, and I can try to assume what's in David's mind, but I can't know. So I wonder, was he reducing the size of a potential army that the Moabites might rally again to, to attack Israel and here he has the opportunity to reduce their number without destroying them completely? Was he reducing the number of people that needed to be fed? Perhaps the resources of the land were starting to run down and, and this was one way to reduce that. Still sounds horrendous for us. I, I wonder this too. Was it in fact mercy that spared the lives of a third of these people? I don't know. I, I can't answer these questions that I'm asking myself. But what I can say is that the Bible doesn't tell us that God approved of this. To be fair, the Bible doesn't tell us that God disapproved of it either. And so for me, this is one of those hard sayings of the Bible. One of these hard sections that I struggle with, that I wrestle with, and that I live in the tension of. I won't give up what I do understand of the Bible just because there's a few things I don't understand. I won't give up what I do understand just because there's a few things I don't understand. I won't give up on the God of the Bible because there's a few things I don't understand when there is so much I do. Some of you may have seen the film that was out recently, The Jesus Revolution. If you have, I'd love to hear about it because I never got to see it. Um, but that involves a guy named Chuck Smith, Jesus people, great, great moment in church history. But one thing Chuck Smith did say, and I don't know if it's in the film, is never trade what you do know for what you don't know. 
So I urge you, you who say that you are people of this book, when you are confronted by something here that is confusing, that is uncertain, that is not easy to explain, don't give up what you do know for what you don't know. And if someone says to you, do you believe in unicorns? Because there are unicorns in the Bible. Well, come and talk with me about that and I'll help you to answer that question. We learn in 2 Samuel chapter 8 that David's victories are not just over the Philistines and Moab. And a careful reading, a more careful reading of the, uh, of the chapter helps me to see that it's, it's the Philistines, it's the Moabites, and then there's this group who came to help Hadadezer and some others as well. And uh, what we are seeing here is the expansion of the kingdom of Israel. So the defeat of the Philistines covers the west. In verse 2, it spans the east. In verses 3 and 5, the north. And in verses 13 and 14, the south. So all points of the compass from Jerusalem are being expanded under David's authority. If you have this book, an atlas, even Google might help you here, uh, you'll be able to see where that's going. What do we expect from a, a leader who rules with justice and righteousness? We would expect that they would defeat the enemies of his people. And this is what David is doing here. Um, we should also note that chapter 8, there's a long period of time covered in chapter 8 that might not be clear for us here. Anyway, we should also know that this is what Jesus does too, that Jesus defeats the enemies of his people. And what is the greatest enemy of his people? Sin, Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We read from Colossians chapter 3. If you jumped back to Colossians chapter 2, you would read this statement. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away. How? Nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I just love that statement, a public spectacle of them. And the day will come when Jesus like David with the Moabites, that Jesus will divide humanity. We get a hint of it in John chapter 5, verse 24, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. And we get a picture of it in Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus talks about the Son of Man who comes in glory, all his angels with him. He will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. What do you do if you are ruling your own life with justice and righteousness? And as a king who does that, and Jesus who does that, seeks to destroy the enemies of his people, what do you do with the enemies of your soul? Peter read to us from Colossians chapter 3 earlier. And as you listened, you would have heard there, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And it's a terrible list that's here. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed which is idolatry. The wrath of God comes because of these things. What do you do with the enemies of your soul? Put them to death. Have you killed some sins lately? One of the other things that a ruler like David will do is not just to protect his people from the enemy at the moment, he will protect his people from future attacks. And so in verses 6 and 14, we see that David set up garrisons in other places. What's a garrison? What is this strange word? Well, it's a body of troops 
stationed in a particularly, particular location to guard it, but will also be the first line of defence if there is an army marching against the main city. You see, protection isn't just about destroying the enemy at hand. Sometimes it is doing what you can to keep the enemy away. What do you expect from a king who rules with justice and righteousness for all his people? Well, he protects his people. He does that by destroying the enemy and setting things up to keep the enemy away. Are you doing that for your own soul? Are you destroying the enemy of your soul? And are you putting garrisons in place to keep the enemy away? In a few weeks, we will come to chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. Some of you know that chapter. Some of you will read ahead to find out, ooh, what's he talking about? And we will deal with things like sexual immorality, impurity and lust when we come to that chapter. One of the other things that we would expect of such a leader is that he will make careful use of resources that are available to him. I couldn't think of a better way to word that and it feels like a bit of a weak point but come with me anyway. We see here that there are people who bring tribute to David, that they become his servants and that they bring tribute. It's like a tax that they are bringing. But that's not true of all the groups who are listed here. Only two are listed as bringing tribute. Now, is it unfair that David expects and demands that of people whose land he's taken over? Well, in one sense, again, gee, I struggle with that. It it feels difficult. It feels wrong that that would be the case. But I want to put it on the other side. David rules with justice and righteousness for all his people. These people have become his servants. They are his people. David is now obliged to provide for these people too. And so they are paying their tribute, perhaps as part of that. Put that into our own context as Christian people in a church gathering. And one of those things, one of the things that we do is we bring our gifts and our tithe. Now for many of us who grew up in a church and gee, it was only a couple of years ago that we stopped doing it, we would, during our church worship service, we would pass a bowl or some bags around and and we would put in our financial offerings. Sometimes in an envelope, sometimes just uh, cash. Uh, Some people were very tech savvy and started doing electronic giving. And then our... uh, Our state premier decided to lock us down. Thank you, Anne, I'm being careful. And, uh, and we couldn't gather and we couldn't do that. And so we all began using, well, for the most of us, began using electronic giving. And we've continued to do that. We are bringing our tribute to God in that way. We have a box at the back which looks a little hidden behind hand sanitizer at the moment, but... There is that there as well for people to place their gifts and tithes into. One of the really important things for David and one of the ways he shows justice and righteousness is that everything that is brought in is not for his own benefit. We live in a world of corrupt leaders. Not all, and I don't for a moment want to suggest all, but we live in a world of corrupt leaders where people will put themselves, get themselves into a position of power and authority and sometimes get there with the very best of motives, a great desire to help their nation and end up just becoming so corrupt and so wealthy at the great expense of the health and well-being of their own people. And while my mind goes to some particular African leaders generally past, possibly present. I don't want for a moment to suggest it's only African leaders who are in that position. But not King David. In verses 11 and 12, we read this statement. 
that King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued. He also dedicated the plunder taken from Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. The spoils of these wars are set aside for the building of the temple, not for his own benefit, not for his own glory. So in trusting the promises that God has made that we read about in chapter 7, David not only prays believing that the promise will be true, he acts believing the promise will be true, that his son will be the one to build a temple, and that being the case, I will get things ready. It is a leadership free from financial corruption. What do you expect from a king who rules with justice and righteousness for all his people? Oh yes, that. He would be careful with the resources that are there for all the people. The third thing is that he recognises his place. And, and here in that last section of chapter 8, uh, and there's a really significant change of tone at verse 15. Earlier we've had all these wars and battles and victories and, and treasure and that's great and dedication to the temple, that's wonderful But then in verse 15, David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. And then we get this list of people and their roles. The king has a team. The king is not alone. There is great wisdom in this. For no one person can fulfill all the roles that leadership requires. And if one person does believe they can do that, or they're wrong, They're narcissistic and they will not help people. We see this earlier in the Bible in the story of Moses when his father-in-law comes to him, sees him trying to solve the problems of everybody and saying to him, what you're doing is not good. The work is too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. Listen, I'll give you some advice and may God be with you. Select capable men from all the people, those who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. There's a... There's a clue. Appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. But have them bring every difficult case to you. Spread the load of leadership. We see it later in the story of the church in Acts chapter 6 where the church is beginning, it's growing, uh, people are in need, the disciples are increasing And there's this conflict between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and this significant phrase is this. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables, which does not denigrate the ministry of waiting on tables. It would not be good... It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And we need to see this in the current era of church history too. Why? Because, sadly, church leaders are not immune from narcissism, self-grandizement, if that's the right word, or thinking too much of themselves. It also impacts negatively on that minister and on the church. So I heard this a few weeks ago. The ministers who have a very hands-on, doing lots approach to ministry and leadership were more burnt out than those who had a more doing ministry through others, through the leading on revision and inspiration and communication. Uh, Now, here's my confession. I'm more likely to be the former kind than the latter kind. I'm more likely to try to do everything myself rather than seek to bring others along with me. That's no good for me and it's not real good for the church. So, um, If you see me doing stuff you think you could do, don't be afraid to ask. If there's other things you think you could do to serve the church, don't be afraid 
to ask. We can spend a lot more time on that. What? Let's come back to David, though. His position, the king, he's really a prince. He is always under God's authority. So it's significant that amongst the people who are listed here are priests. Now, just a quick footnote, some of your translations will say that David's sons were priests. In the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles, they are described as chief officials, chief advisors, which is how it's translated here in 2 Samuel chapter 8. Whether it was wise for David's sons to be chief advisors, well, that's up for grabs because in a few chapters we're going to see the character of those sons. That might not have been a good move. But there are also priests. There are priests there amongst that group, and that's important. What's the role of a priest? To intercede between that person and God. This is David's strength. He is always under God's authority. The Psalms testify it. This book of 2 Samuel testifies to it. He is there to serve God and to serve his people. And that aspect of David is seen later in Jesus, David's greatest son, when Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's wrap this up. What do you expect from a king who rules with justice and righteousness for all his people? Well, as we turn the page from chapter 8 into chapter 9, we will see what we would expect to see. Justice. Justice unlike that shown in his time, and kindness to those who might be seen as an enemy. In chapter 10, we will again see David as a leader with kindness and a leader with courage. And then we'll turn to chapter 11 and everything changes. And so in all this, we see that David was a good king, but we see that we need a great king. And while the Bible will have some chapters that are difficult for us to understand, the chapters, they're not all like that, and the chapters that are not so hard to understand make clear for us who Jesus is and why it matters that we know him. He is the great king. So whose side are you on? Let's pray. Our loving Lord God, we thank you for, uh, for the, this book which confronts us and challenges us and uh, makes us stop and pray and, and try to understand what you're doing. So Lord, thank you for that wrestling. But Lord, thank you too that there are things here that are very clear for us. Your love, your grace, your mercy, your victory. Help us rely on you as we seek to put to death the old self and all its wicked ways. Lord, we would choose to be on the Lord's side. Help us by your mercy and grace. I pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen.